Good afternoon and welcome to Trial Talk Live. I'm Candace Dressler, your moderator, and Cynthia Anderson will be watching the chat for your questions. As you know, our speaker today is Caroline Kohler, and she is going to present about tree decay. Caroline is finishing up her MG training and is responsible for the lovely design of our brand new MGOttawa.ca website. Caroline has kindly developed a handout to go with her talk today, and we will be sharing it in the chat closer to the end of the presentation. I know you've got lots to, lots to talk about, Caroline, so go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, today we're going to be... Um, um, reviewing a little bit on uh, under, understanding decay in, tree, in trees. And um, so I'll start right away with what is wood decay? So wood decay is a biological process where cellulose and lignin are converted to carbon dioxide and water with a release of energy to maintain forest processes. Um, this usually, um, so decay usually happens after microorganisms go through a point of entry in the tree. And when um, they invite, invade a tree stem uh, through the wounds, they do so in succession. Um, bacteria, non-decay fungi, and decay fungi are often intimately associated with this invasion process. And when microorganisms invade, they first sur surmount the chemical protective barriers um, set up by the tree, and then they move into the tree from compartment to compartment and, um, and also the decay eventually gets um, co compartmentalized as well and trapped inside, inside the, the tree. Um, you have to, uh, remember also that wounds start the processes that can lead to decay. So here, uh, I wanted to, um, to talk about what if decay is good or bad. And the, the bad about decay is that it can render a tree hazardous by creating defects inside the tree or in the tree structure. Um, there is many diseases that, are in, that involve wood decay, like stem decays or root diseases. Um, it can be economically important uh, if you have to replace a tree or if you have a, a company that uses wood products as well. Um, there is unfortunately no cure uh, if the fungi cannot be uh, the fungi cannot be removed uh, from the soil after the removal of the tree. Um, the good about wood decay is that it contributes to the nutrient cycle by by re recycling the elements in wood. So it is a natural process. Um, it provides also habitat for wildlife and it provides food sources as well for many species. Um, it also supports a high quality soil. It's a major contributor to hummus and organic matter. And it's a source of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it also facilitates seedlings as, uh, establishment by, by retaining moisture and providing nutrients to the seedlings as well. Here, uh, I wanted to show you, to share with you some pictures I took um, that are related to what I just talked about. Um, so there's Monotropa uniflora, which is a, a ghost pipe. It's a, a herbaceous perennial that grows in a hummus-rich forest soil. So this plant needs that, that hummus uh, that is formed through decomposition. Um, also, this old man of the wood mushroom uh, grows on forest floor as well, and it's a mycorrhizal uh, with hardwood trees, uh, specifically uh, oaks. And um, in this last picture, it's a picture that I took while we were hiking with the kids. And uh, we found this tree, this tree stem, the base, the base of the tree completely disconnected. And it, it was rotten, um, for, like it broke off from decomposition. And the, the upper part of the stem was still being retained by the neighboring trees. So you can imagine how, how much of a hazard this could be <laughs> in an urban setting. In this case, it was in a forest setting, but um, this is why, you know, decomposition can be quite hazardous as well. So signs of decays, uh, decay, um, there's a lot of signs and they're not necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have this sign that it's absolutely decay that you have in your tree, it can be related to other diseases as well. So these are just signs that that could lead to decay. And, and it's, it's a, uh, if you find these signs on your tree, then you should investigate and, and really you know, keep track of what's going on with your tree. 
Uh, some signs are more obvious than others. So we have big uh, dead branches, branch dieback at the tip. So if the branches are dying at the tip, um, leaf issues like dieback, spotting, discoloration, thinning of canopy as well. Um, then mushrooms. So mushrooms are really a good sign that you have tree decay because fungi is one of the decay organisms that is really present usually when you have rotting. Um, so if you see mushrooms on the trunk, on the branches, on the root flare, or even on the ground around your tree, um, it's a good sign that you have decay going on in there. Um, soft sections on the tree, decaying bays or oozing. If you have cavities forming underneath the bark, holes, splits in the trunk, cracks in the bark as well, these create entry points for microorganisms to invade. So you want to keep an eye on that. There's also, you know, um, damage that can be caused by woodpeckers, sapsuckers, or rodents. And um, if you see sawdust around the base of the tree, um, that could be caused by borers or carpenter ants as well. Uh, it's a good sign that you might have tree decay uh, going on. Um, also, one of uh, the interesting sign as well is if your tree is newly leaning. So if your tree used to be straight and you know, this year it's it's leaning a bit. You, you want to check the root area and make sure that the soil is not heaving up on one side or cracking. Because if your tree is leaning, this, there's a good chance, if it's newly leaning, it's a good chance that your tree is going to fall. So you want to probably call an arborist at that point and make sure that your tree is safe uh, for the people that are, are using this area, the area around it. Um, here are some pictures of trees on my own property. So there's a sugar maple on the first one on the left. Um, this sugar maple used to be on, in our backyard, which was in a northern, northern exposure. And we had to move it due to renovations. We moved it on the front side of our uh, property, which is on the southwestern side. And sugar maple has a thinner bark. And what happened is that with the weather fluctuation, the bark eventually split and crack um, on, because on the south side, it's warmer. So there's more heat going on there. And so this creates a really large entry point for microorganisms to invade as well. Um, I also have a pin cherry on the front yard. And this one was there when we moved here. And this pin cherry, the first summer we moved here, to, it was very rainy and I noticed a lot of oozing going on and cracking. And eventually now after five years, this is what it looks like. There was sap sucker damage and this oozing. And you can see that there's decay going on in the middle, like where the, the, the hardwood is. Um, also on the right side, there's a, a quaking aspen uh, with a large cavity um, showing signs of white rot. Uh, you can see uh, bleaching as well, and there's even fruiting bodies inside the cavity. So this is probably due to an old pruning wound that never actually sealed properly, and so the, the organisms just kept on going and going in, inside there. Um, uh, to explain decay, it's important to understand a little basic tree biology. So I wanted to, you know, touch touch um, uh, plant. Uh, I won't say it, plant cell walls. <laughs> and so the plant cell walls is what gives a structure to the tree. It's what keeps the, the tree up. Uh, as opposed to us humans, we need muscles, bones, and nervous systems to, to keep us up and going. But the trees, they just need their cell walls. So here, the cell walls are composed of cellulose bundles, which are um, polymer, uh, a, a polymer compound uh, made up of glucose units, so sugars. Then you have these uh, bundles are uh, wrapped with hemicellulose, which is also another, it's a variety of carbohydrates that, that keep it together. And then around that there's lignin, which is slightly brown. So this is what gives the color brown to uh, the, the tree wood. And this lignin acts as the glue that keeps everything together. And here, you know, it looks organized, but it's not disorganized in reality. So this is just a very simple graphic to show you a little bit about uh, the biology. I also needed to talk about compartmentalization of decay in trees, uh, so CODID, which was is a concept that was brought forward by Dr. Alex Shigo. And he was a tree pathologist for the United States Forest Service. He wrote uh, a bunch of very interesting books, uh, which I recommend. 
But his concept is basically based on two major points. Um, one is that a tree is highly compartmentalized. And after a tree is wounded, the resulting defects are compartmentalized as well. So to, to better explain this, I, I created little illustrations because I, I'm, I'm visual myself, so I like, to, <laughs> I like to share something visual. So what I did here is that I created a, a tree stem um, and then I added a, a fictional you know, damage to the tree. And um, so as soon as there's a wound, there's a reaction zone that's already there really. So it's walls one, two, and three. Walls one is the vertical, it resists the vertical spread of the microorganisms that could potentially enter the wound. And then walls two resist the inward spread of organisms, which, and walls, walls two are basically the annual growth rings of the tree. And then walls three is the ray cells. So you see those little lines, you know, when we draw a tree, normally we make these little lines here, um, that are, like oblique lines um, and they're not exactly perfect they're usually a bit disorganized um, and these walls help inhibit the lateral spread of the microorganism entering the wound and then um, the last type of wall is the strongest wall it's wall four and wall four is created by the cambium layer generating new cells so the cambium layer is basically the layer that makes your three your tree grow year after year and that layer produces cell inwards and outwards and um, so here I, I was trying to show you how the cambium layer could grow and eventually you know grow inwards inside the cavity and and fill the cavity of the tree and this would seal the cavity and prevent more microorganisms from entering inside the tree. At that point, there would be some that would have entered already during the time, you know, if it took two to two, two to three years, let's say, to seal the cavity, you would have two to three years of uh, possible um, invasion of microorganisms and insects coming inside your tree. At, at the same time, there's also a chemical reaction zone that is, uh, that is created by the tree cells. And these chemicals prevent the organisms from traveling inside the tree as well. So they resist as well inside. So everything is kind of pushing everything in so that it doesn't spread too much. Um, and this creates a compartment then. That's why we call it compartmentalization because it, it compartmentalizes the decay inside the tree. And as the cambium layer uh, produces more cells and continues growing year after year, you can see that the new wood is not affected by the chemical reaction zone or is not decayed because the new wood is, is protected um, because there's this barrier that was formed when there was a chemical reaction zone and so on. So if your wound seals really fast, uh, there's a chance that your tree is not going to be that affected by wood decay because um, because it's just going to continue growing and it's going to keep everything in one place. Um, also, well, wood decay is usually caused by fun uh, a fungus. Um, there's different type of fungi um, affecting trees. There's also bacteria affecting uh, trees that can cause wood decay as well. But today I wanted to talk more about uh, two and three different types of rods. Um, so here we have white rot that's uh, caused by um, a lot of different types of mushrooms. And um, usually they travel through air and they fall inside the, the wound of the tree and they can start infecting and traveling inside the tree. Um, so in, in, the type of, in the case of white rot, the white rot, it, it's going to destroy all the components of the tree cell of the plant cell wall. So the cellulose, the hemicellulose and the lignin. And this will cause the tree to, the, the wood to become moist, soft, spongy or stringy. And um, it's, it often, it's often going to leave a hollow. Uh, the texture will be fibrous and you might see some bleaching occur because, the, because of the oxidation of an in loss of lignin. So there's no more brown color basically. And um, the, this type of rot usually occurs in hardwood trees. Um, it can occur in the softwood, but less often, often. And these are types of organisms uh, or mushrooms, I guess, that, that 
could invade um, your tree or, or they're a good sign that your tree has white rot. So the elm oyster mushroom, the pheasant back mushroom and the scaly cap. And there's many, many, many other that I couldn't name here because there's just too many. Um, so here, if you can see, like, especially the pheasant back mushroom, you can see that it's at the base of the tree. And this is very, very uh, important for the structure of the tree. So if I had this on one of my tree, I would certainly call an arborist because I would want to assess my, my tree stem and my roots to make sure that they're still sound and that the tree is not going to fall over. Um, this is also, I wanted to show you the texture of white rot. So you see it, it's like, it's, it's, it's bleached, it's fibrous, and um, uh, it's, it's not, you can see that there's a loss of lignin here. Um, another type of rot is brown rot. And this type of rot, uh, decays cellulose and hemicellulose. So it leaves you with lignin. It leaves the tree with lignin. So it gives a brown color um, to, to the tree, to, the, to what's left of the tree anyways. Um, it also has this special texture which is, it shrinks the wood, it, it cracks it and it readily uh, crumbles it into cubes. Uh, so we call it cubicle rot as well. Um, and this type of rot uh, usually occurs in softwood trees, but it, it does occur in hardwood sometimes, but not as, as, as much. And it can really cause issues because it will, uh, become it will become a hazard very quickly because it travels very fast uh, inside the wood and it will um, consume basically uh, the cellulose and hemicellulose very quickly. These are types of mushrooms that uh, can cause brown rot. So you have the velvet top fungus, chicken of the woods, and the red belted conch. And this is the texture of brown rot. So you can see that there's cubical texture. You can imagine touching it and it would crumble into, you know, rectangles or, or, or you know, shapes that are similar to that. Uh, and you can see the color as well, how, how brown it is. There's another type of rot, which is called soft rot. This rot is similar to brown rot, but it doesn't um, uh, travel as fast. Uh, so it can cause extensive damage, but it's usually much slower. Um, it occurs in living trees and uh, it makes the wood look uh, eroded. I don't have a picture for this one, unfortunately. Um, so how um, we were talking about wounding trees and, you know, wounds are entry points for decay organisms to come in. And so in that case, how could we prune a tree without uh, wounding it? And that is impossible because the pruning uh, in itself wounds the tree no matter how you slice it. And so that's why it's important to use proper pruning techniques. Do's and don'ts. So if I had to prune a branch, I would make three cuts. I would cut underneath the branch first to make sure that the bark wouldn't rip because you don't want to rip that cambium layer that produces the wood cells because that, that layer is very important to be able to seal that wound afterwards. So it's very important to cut underneath uh, a few centimeters or inches after the branch collar. Then the second cut would be on top to remove the weight of the branch. And then the third cut would be right at the branch collar, right after the branch collar, I'm sorry, right after, don't cut the branch collar. And um, so the branch collar is that little swollen part that you see between the branch and, and the, the, the main stem. And, and that branch collar has a cambium that will eventually grow and fill that wound. So it's very important to keep it intact. Um, also, if you're gonna, if you need to prune your tree, um, it's always okay to prune uh, if you have a dead branch, a broken branch, or a diseased branch. So at any time of year, it's always okay to do that. Um, pruning during dormancy encourages new growth when the weather is warmer. Pruning trees in the fall will introduce or might introduce diseases or even encourage new growth. So it's not really recommended to prune trees in fall. And then pruning trees in summer can slow the tree's growth. Um, some gardeners use that technique to keep the tree from getting too big too fast. And also, if you have a flowering tree, you should always prune it after the blooming is, is done. <clears throat> Another do's and don't is no flush cuts. So make sure you never cut through the branch collar. 
because at this point you're cutting through the cambium layer that's going to regenerate the cells to fill to to seal that wound and it may eventually seal but what you're doing is really you know you might extend the sealing by two three years and all this time there's going to be more organism coming in your tree and it might not seal properly because you want to have a nice round shape to where you're cutting so that it seals a bit like a donut um so you know no flush cuts then also stubs um do not leave stubs as you can see here this stub is affected by um uh, decay and you can see there's different types of decay because there's um zone lines here so when two decay mushrooms meet it creates zone lines uh, because they secrete melanin and this is what makes that that zone line color um, so what happens here is that if you leave the stub there, there's decay organisms that are going to come in and this, they will enter your tree and enter the main stem as well. And they might spread inside the main stem. So you want to cut as like as close as possible to the branch collar so that it takes the least time possible to seal over that wound. So leaving stub, if you leave a four inch stub, it's going to take, you know, very long before the tree actually uh, seals over. This is a successful pruning seal. You can see that it's sealed over. There's no, you know, you cannot see the inside of the wood, wood at all. And um, here it's a non-successful pruning seal because I can still see a cavity and this wound has been there forever. And yes, maybe one day it's gonna seal over, but by this time, it's, this tree is already affected by white rot in many, many places. So at this point, this tree uh, has been uh, completely affected and is, it's, I, we can call this unsuccessful. So if you suspect your tree to be hazardous, make sure to contact a certified arborist. You can go on the ISA Ontario website and uh, they'll be able to, um, to refer you to a certified arborist. And there's also a handout available. Um, you can, there's more tree care tips in the handout if you want. <laughs> And I think that now is the question period. Thank you, Caroline. So we do have a few questions. Um, I have Suja who's asking, I have a tart cherry tree, it's 20 years old, now has cracks on the trunk, getting larger and oozing. Some branches on that side have died and I have removed them. Can I save my tree? Is there a remedy? Uh, some, well, cherry trees are prone to canker, so um, it might have been caused by canker. It's really hard to assess without pictures. So what I would suggest is, you know, research on uh, the tree diseases, cherry tree diseases, try to identify the disease. Um, also, you know, calling an arborist will really help you make a better decision about your tree. Uh, sometimes it is uh, savable and sometimes it's not. So, um, you know, you might be able to salvage it. In my case, my pin cherry has been here for five years with canker and it's still flowering and producing berries for the birds to eat. So I'm, I'm keeping it and it's not a hazard for my family either. So, you know, it depends on the situation. I think, I think you need to go and assess and ask a professional. Okay, we have another question. Uh, if my tree has a stub, should I trim them back? And as it shows in the slide, uh, would you go back and trim the stub so it would heal properly? Absolutely. I would absolutely go back and remove all these stubs that are sticking out. I mean, it's normal, like all of us, we didn't know how to prune before and we might know now. And so, so yes, it's never a bad time to go and remove those stubs because your tree's still growing year after year. So what you're gonna do is that you're gonna expedite the sealing process by going back and cutting these stubs. I have another question. So uh, the question is, do I paint or do I not paint? No, never. So sealing uh, with a, with a some, some people use a paint like a sealer paint and it's really not recommended. Uh, you want to let the tree do its own thing. They're able to seal it their, themselves. And <clears throat> some people even, you know, fill the tree cavities with cement. So really don't do that. Just don't touch the tree. Um, don't, don't try and seal it. It's just, it's going to produce chemicals itself. It's able to seal itself. Just let it do its thing. What do you recommend as good fertilizer practices for preventing 
tree decay? Um, for sure, fertilizing the tree is really good. And, and in my case, um, I found out that using tree spike is not the best. It's, it's probably better to use, uh, to sprinkle fertilizer around the whole root area to, be, to have a better coverage of the root area. Um, because you don't really know where the, the roots are. Uh, so it's just best to cover all the roots and never near um, the main stem. So you want to, you know, really fertilize where uh, the drip line is and where the root area would be because um, this is going to give a better chance for your tree to absorb the, the nutrients as well. Uh, another question, does fungi cause the decay or is it a symptom of the decay that the decay is actually present? No, uh, some fungi does cause decay and some bacteria as well, some bacteria as well. Um, it, it, but they, they come in in multiple stages. So sometimes, and, and some, it's debatable that in soft rot that there might be bacteria protecting the tree against uh, decay, uh, fungi decay organisms. So, so um, sometimes um, the bacteria is actually beneficial, uh, but yes, different types of fungi will, um, will uh, fall into the wound and start decomposing the, the, the wood. So yes, it is fungi that's decomposing. Okay, uh, what environmental elements affect our trees in light of decay? Um, well, if, if, um, if there's a storm, if there's wind, you know, a wind storm, just like a storm in general, a thunder, like lightning, uh, these can all cause uh, entry points in your trees. So uh, if there's a large storm, you, you might want to go and inspect your trees afterwards if there's a lot of winds, strong winds, because, um, you know, branches may have broken and you might want to go and and cut back the branches that are at the proper, you know, branch collar, right exterior to the branch collar to give your tree a better chance to uh, recuperate after the storm. So um, I would say that, you know, there's, there's a lot of different abiotic factors that can affect trees, but, um, you know, the, the best thing to do is really to keep an eye on them. And even if you can have a notebook or journal on your trees and, and note, you know, your tree condition and, and uh, this should help you really, you know, keep an eye and track your trees because they're, they're really valuable plants, you know, they, they're very beneficial. <laughs> I have uh, one last question from Iris. Uh, I have a maple trunk, it's three foot high that has 12 inch diameter hole in the middle of the trunk to allow for placement of a planter. Unfortunately, I didn't think that the hole would accumulate water when it rains. Any suggestions to prevent tree decay? Uh, at that point, is is the tree? I'm I'm guessing here that the tree is already dead. Like I mean, it's cut, right? Uh, if I it says a uh, it's a it's a maple trunk, so I'm assuming it's, oh, been it's cut or maple. pruned. Yeah. Uh, so so they cut it and they use it as a ornamental oh. like stuff or like I mean yeah. a tree. Correct. I Correct. I had my maple tree um, cut down because of the storm. It was. Okay. It's four and a half feet diameter. It's huge maple tree. I had to use a crane to oh wow uh, remove the branches. Okay, so in that case, if there's a hole and there's already decay uh, going on, um, there might be some you know antifungal agents that you might mm -hmm. use, but uh, I cannot recommend any here. And um, if you want to prevent decay, you would have to stop the water from coming in. But at this point, if there's already decay, like your tree is dead, so it's going to decay no matter what, unless you start sealing it with some kind of, you know, varnish or something. But I don't, I don't think that's uh, even doable. I would just let the tree do its thing. And, and it's also beneficial for, for nature to have um, dead uh, wood uh, that's in the nature because it provides wildlife habitat as well. So that's what I would do. <laughs> I would just let it rot eventually. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. And, and for all of the great questions, um, we have, we did post the wrong um, a handout at the beginning of the chat, but if you see, we've just posted the, uh, the right handout, the Understanding Decay in Trees. Thank you everyone for attending today and we'll see you next week on Trial Talk Live.